Let's say we have a bunch of books and our goal is to find them as quickly as possible by title. So the obvious solution is to just sort them alphabetically, but this is actually not the best thing we can do. Let's say you want to find a book, and for this example, each book's title is only one letter. So let's say you want to find the book that's F. Do you know where exactly it is? It could be on the very first one, even if it's sorted alphabetically, and then all of the other ones are the rest of the alphabet. It could also be the last one, or somewhere in the middle. You do not know where it is. Granted, it will be a lot quicker to search than searching randomly where you had to check every one because let's say you check this one and this turns out to be a G. That means that F is before it so you don't even need to look at any of these. So now you can focus on this part and then we can continue. Maybe you search here and this is, happens to be a B and then you can look at these two and find out the F is actually here. But still, you needed to look at two of the other books before you can find F. So what if we propose a different solution? Instead of storing all of the books in a row next to each other, what if we created some sort of tray with a bunch of partitions, right? And we labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And then if we have a book in H, we just put one here. If we have a book in A, we just put one here. We have a book in D, we just put one here. We have a book in B, we just put it here. And then a, and a G book and an F book, etc. Now, if we want to find F, we don't even need to know or look at the other books because we know that F will always be here regardless of the existence or not existence of the other books. And this is indeed the fastest way because if we have hundreds of books with different names, right, we can expand this. And still, you know exactly where F is without comparing anything at all. So what if our book titles are not just one letter? What we have to do, of course, is then we have to extend the tray, right? We have the A, B, C, D, all of the one letter words, and then we have to do something like A, 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 B, etc., right? And then do that, and then B, B, A, B, B, and then we have A, A, B, A, 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 B, and then we can count up each of them, and we will put every possible combination of books that exist in here. But what you will realize soon is that if we begin to fill out this tray, most of the places are empty because there likely isn't a book called A. There likely isn't a book called B. There's a book called Harry Potter, but there likely isn't a book called Harry Potter Z, for example. So most of the tray are gaps, and now you probably have miles upon miles of trays for each of the possible com combinations of book names that you have. So a simple solution is that instead of looking at the full thing, we keep our original 26 element tray and only look at the first letter of each book. So Harry Potter will simply be in the H tray, and here will be Harry Potter. And when we have another book, we can just put it, for example, in the E section for something that for a book that starts with E. Now, if you have another book that starts with H, such as The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, then you have two places to write the books that you won't, but you can only fit one. So this is a problem. And this means that you can store stuff in a much smaller amount of space. But the problem is that you risk chances of having two books being squished in one place, which is not possible, and then you have to look through both of the books. Because if we have another book beginning with H, we won't know where to put it. And so this method of changing a value, that could be a string or anything else that has different sizes and could change into something that has a fixed size and a fixed value. For example, H is what we could call technically a hash function. This is a basic hash function, but admittedly not a very good one. So let's look at a couple properties that these can have for it to count as a hash function. The first thing is that it has a fixed length. And this is just something that makes stuff like what I have talked about previously, making it into one letter long, or however letters long you want. It's just a helpful property for it to have. The second thing is that it is deterministic. Meaning that whenever you give it the same input, it should give you the same output. It shouldn't be that when you run this over again, it will give you something like F. That should not happen. The third part is what distinguishes this message from like an actually good one. And that is, it should be mostly evenly distributed. What this means is that, for example, if we have another Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the blah blah blah, and that's all we have in our library, that's not very useful because all of them will give us H and that just basically means that there will be duplicates. and that would be really bad. So if this one is Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, this one is Harry Potter and blah blah blah, what would be good is that we could somehow make it so that it is still deterministic, but it might give you a different value with a small change. For example, this one could be a G. Although it starts with mostly the same name, it could give us a different value 
so that as a result, whatever books you have will be evenly spread along the range of values that you want. However, just to keep in mind is that information is definitely lost. Information is lost. For something like a 10 letter long word name, you can have like millions upon millions of different titles. However, if we want to compact it into a single letter, we only have 26 possible combinations. If you had millions of books, each with every possible name that can ever, ever be typed, then of course there will be hundreds and hundreds of duplicates. But we rely on that most values will be empty so that the chances of values colliding will be very small. This chance of colliding is actually not zero. As evenly distributed as this is, there will still be a 1 in 26 chance that two titles that are different will give you the same result. And finally, we have to focus on its efficiency because no matter how efficient this method of storing stuff in trace are, if this takes 10 seconds to compute, it will be slower than any method possible. Let us look at one hash function that's actually better and more practical. So our goal is that for any sort of title that we have, for example, Harry Potter, no matter how closely related all of the inputs are, we want the output to be as maximally distributed as possible. So that instead of just, for example, you using better to compact the string, we can think of something like we can scramble it a bit. And this might remind you about random number generators. And I have made a great video about how they work. But basically, one property is that if you give them the same seed, they will give you numbers that look random. But if you give a seed of like, for example, zero, it will give you a number like five, eight, one, seven, etc., etc. But they're not actually random because if you give them the same seeds, the random number generator will give you the same random numbers. And we can actually use this in our case so that for, for example, the word Harry Potter, we use that as a seed. And this could give us a value of like five. And then if we change a very little bit, for example, instead of Harry Potter, we say Harry Peter, right? It, could, it should give us a completely different value like zero. And we can actually use this as a hash function because now, instead of, for example, as before, if we just simply label these as um, letters, for example, this one is H, all of our Harry Potter books would be grouped at one place and then they will collide and duplicate with each other. But instead of if we have them as kind of like an ID, that will shuffle around however they want, then all of them will be distributed. Maybe one of them is here, one of them is there, one of them is there, etc, etc. And you won't have to worry about them colliding as much. So what I have shown you here is what we call a hash table because it uses a table and a hash function. This is, for example, used in JavaScript objects. So if you have something like um, person, right, that has like a name, Bob, age, 10, and then maybe like a very long name, very long key, like favorite flavor of ice cream, blah, blah, blah. And then you can have this as uh, whatever, right? Regardless of the length of these, we want to find them as quickly as possible. So as our previous thing, if you sort them alphabetically, you need to still go through a bunch of them and check and like find it. Or the hash function, we can convert each of these to hashes. So maybe this hash could be like something like, four, this one could be, and this one could be like seven. And again, this only relates to the key. It doesn't relate to the value because we can change the value however we want. But basically now, if you want to access a person dot name, you can see something like, all right, name, we can hash that. And this gives us a value of four. So we can go to the location for which Bob is actually stored and get that. And in real life, of course, hashes are typically one letter or one character. So typically much longer than this. They could be like some sort of um, 128 distance chart that's like 8, E, 0, 5, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It could be like a very long thing in reality. But regardless of how that works, the goal is to change uh, arbitrary numbers that you have set and sort of compact it or distribute it into a way that it's easy to get, but also doesn't take up much. The hash function's property of a small change in the input making a big change on the output is something that we can use for a tool called checksums. So let's say you have downloaded a file from somewhere, right? You have a file online and you just download it to your computer. And this might just be like, for example, a text file. 
let's say somehow in the downloading process and maybe the internet connection, a small change of one letter appeared in the file. How would you know that that letter changed? What you can do is of course download two copies and then if you compare them and if they're different, that means one of them is incorrect. However, there's a better strategy because that takes up twice the amount of space and probably twice the amount of time to do. Another thing you can do is basically pass the entire content of the file into one of our hash functions. And this could give us like a value of like, I don't know, three. And we do the same thing. And this number three is also downloaded with your file. So you have this thing at three. What you can do is take this, right? You take our downloaded file and run the hash function again. We run the hash function and if it still gives you three, it's very likely for it to be still accurate. But if it gives us another number like um, eight, that could mean that definitely something changed. It could be the file that changed or it could actually be the actual value downloaded that's incorrect. Maybe here it, that's a three and then you download it as a two. That could also be a possibility. But you know that somewhere something has gone wrong. And of course, if you have this as a much longer string, so instead of three, it's like 3015, et cetera, et cetera, the likelihood that by chance, they're going to be the same thing would be very small. Therefore, instead of having two duplicate files that you had to download to check if one of them was uh, incorrect, you basically can have like a small tag here that actually tells you what the hash is and you just have to compare that to see if the two files are unchanged. The final thing that hash functions are greatly useful for is passwords. And so let's say we have a website that you can enter your password in. So what you would do is that after you have entered your password, you have to send that over somewhere to the internet to some sort of like the company's computer where they can check if that password is correct and then send a result back to say correct and then you can log on and whatever. One option is that they have to store the password in some way. So if they actually have your password here, maybe they have like a table with your username, right? Your username could be A for this example. They just have your password, they go to A, they check your username, check your password is right, returns it back. But this has multiple problems because first of all, the internet's communication thing isn't exactly the safest. Someone could just, for example, watch over the connection to the internet, see that your password is transmitted over, go to the website and then log in with your password, right? That's one possible thing. Another possible way is that here, uh, they could just literally go and somehow get access to the company's computer. And then you have literally everybody's passwords and you can just enter it here and then just go in and log in. What can we do about a hash? The thing is that whenever you enter a password, right? Let's say your password is that hello world. Instead of directly passing in the text hello world to here, we use a hash function to generate some sort of actual value. This time it gives us five. And then we just simply pass the number five into the server, right? We pass the number five into the server. And in the server, all it has is that A is five. Now I can check five, five, all right, correct. That's hello world. Now, if somebody sees the letter five, they can't just simply go here and enter in the letter five. That would give you a different hash because if we hash the output of the hash, it could give you something like a zero or something else, which would not be correct. So the only way they can get away with this is that they can somehow have to figure out the password. One thing that you have to do is basically try every single thing until you find the correct password. This operation only goes one way. You can calculate five from hello world, but you cannot calculate hello world from five easily. If assuming our ID thing is only one digit, it's actually pretty easy to hack because let's say we're evenly distributed. The possible outputs are only zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we can just keep trying A, we can try a B, we can try a C, we can try a D. If we try all the letters of the alphabet, which has 26 of them, so it's likely that more than one of them will fall on the letter five, even though it's not as long as hello world because most of that information is lost. So if we just try the alphabet, you could find it. It's correlated to like how long the hash is. So if this is like a much longer number, then they will have a much harder time of finding one that has the exact number of combinations. When you type in hello world right here, it's calculated on your computer. It doesn't send anywhere. The hello world piece of text is not anywhere other than on here. So that it's not, the company doesn't know it, the internet doesn't know it, nowhere else knows it. And 
In a follow-up video, I could go into more depth about passwords because this one option is that if everybody has the password hello world or hello world is a very common password, they could just see five and be like, oh, that's the password for hello world. They could have like a list of stuff of common passwords that they can have and they can hack it that way. So there's more advanced techniques of preventing those things from happening. So if you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.